Tonight's talk is actually one of the things I've been looking forward to uh, the most at practice. Um, for the most part, kind of because it touches on something Frank said, which is uh, in the channels that I follow uh, and in the people uh, I listen to, there's been a big conversation. Maybe some of you have uh, similarly experienced this. There's been a, a big, been a big conversation over the past year or so about what is and is not a game uh, and what, how do we draw those boundaries. Uh, but I think what's really amazing is even if you draw those boundaries kind of conservatively, you still find games everywhere. You still, you, if you look, you see that like games are just tucked into almost every corner uh, of life and culture. Uh, and I've always thought that that's really amazing and it's always been one of the things that I like uh, the most. Um, so uh, at practice, we, we try to embrace this sort of thing and we try to have sort of a left field uh, speaker come in. Uh, we've had war gamers and we've had uh, you know, the rules, uh, the, the director of rules for NCAA football the past couple of years. Uh, but tonight we're gonna hear about uh, hip hop dance battles, uh, which uh, I'm very excited. So uh, let me very quickly uh, check my phone and introduce our two speakers. Uh, we have Susanna uh, Queen Envy Lou. Uh, she's a B-girl representing Supreme Beings crew from uh, Queens uh, and the Florox crew from Boston. Since beginning her B-girl career in 2003, she has been organizing and promoting successful breaking events through colleges such as MIT and NYU. Uh, Susanna joined the chicken and beer team during the spring of uh, 2008. As part of the team, she is responsible for promotion as well as event coordination. Uh, while Susanna's passion is dance, her current occupation is a PhD student at, at Vile Cornell Medical School, so very impressive. Uh, our, other, uh, our other speaker is uh, Katya. Uh, during the day, Katya is a content producer at E-Line Media, so a fellow New York game designer. Everybody make sure you say hi. Um, a developer of video games for kids. Uh, after work, she assumes her alter ego as B-Girl Gypsy, a member of the Florax and Floor Obsession crews. She's been a competitive B-girl for nine years and has organized multiple B-boy jams. Her most recent jam, uh, organized by Eddie uh, Yu, AKA Lil Foot, um, uh, who's also a pretty good Street Fighter player from what I've heard, um, <laughs> of Floor Obsession, combined game mechanics with traditional competition uh, in the fun and unorthodox event, Unlucky Breaks. Katya has been an active member of the breakdance scenes in Boston, Denver, Barcelona, and New York City. She has won a solid handful of first place titles in competitions across the country. So please, everybody, welcome Katya and Susanna. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm sure Katya is as well. Um, let me pull up my presentation. Okay. Okay. All right, so again, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about breaking and uh, b-boy jams. Um, just a little bit about the history and the organization of it. I'm trying to get this out for you. Right. Oh, thanks. You go up here. Okay. <laughs> so um, a brief history. Hip hop is a creative movement which started in New York City in the early 1970s. And um, there are basically four elements um, of hip hop. Some say that knowledge is the fifth element. <laughs> but um, so for the verbal aspect, we have emceeing, um, also known as rapping. And um, when done correctly, it can be very poetic, unlike probably what you've heard on the radio in recent years. Um, and then so for the musical aspect, we have um, turntablism or DJing. And again, um, it goes beyond gluing songs together at the club. Um, Turntabling involves a lot of scratching, tripping. It's really difficult. Um, and then we have the artistic aspect, the visual aspect, which is graffiti. And if you guys want to see some really good graffiti, please go to Five Points in Long Island City before the city tears the building down. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, of course, the physical aspect, you have breaking, um, or as you know it as breakdancing which actually is a term that was coined by the media in the 1980s. But as dancers, we refer to it as breaking. And dancers who break are called B-boys or B-girls. And it stands for break boy or break girl because we get down to the break of the song. And um, it was developed in the 70s um, in parties and in clubs where uh, people who attend these parties will try to one-up each other in these um, clubs and as such they try to bring in other elements. They take elements from salsa or martial arts. Martial arts is a huge thing for us dancers. And they begin to add more and more difficult elements 
eventually getting down to the floor on all fours and, and then eventually spinning on all parts of your body. We have like head spins, hand spins, knee spins, shoulder spins. <laughs> so all of that. And then eventually um, it caught the eye of the media and you have movies such as Beat Street or Flashdance being made in the 1980s and then it blew up in the United States. And um, because the American population is so fickle, it quickly died. However, um, in the worldwide scale, it really began to take root. And um, outsiders outside of America began to see breaking as more of an art form as opposed to a lot of people in the US um, because of the way hip hop moved towards the direction of gangster rap and all that. Um, breaking and anything related to hip hop became seen as a negative thing. So it's not really, sadly, it's not very well supported um, in the United States. So next slide, please. So um, this is, so outside of the US, um, internationally, like I said, breaking began to take, um, take root. And internationally, it blew up. So this is a big event in Germany called Battle of the Year. And it was started in 1990. And the format of this is um, crews from all over the world in many different countries, they hold qualifiers. And the format is they have, they put together performances. So instead of battling right off the bat, they put together a show. And then based on the quality of the show, the judges will pick the top four and then the top two will battle for the first and second place, and then the three and the fourth place will battle for the third and fourth place. And so I just pulled up a couple of pictures here. Um, battle of the Year is sponsored by Braun, um, and you can see in the audience that there are thousands of people. And I mean, this is pretty much unheard of in the United States where you have a breakdance battle where thousands of people will attend. Um, next slide. Oh, okay, so Battle of the Year again, um, it became really popular, so a couple, of, uh, maybe five years ago, I think, um, a Korean-American director named Benson Lee made a documentary following um, four different teams, one from France, one from the U.S., one from Korea, and one from Japan. And it followed their journey in training um, to get to Battle of the Year. And then it was really popular and it was screened in the Tribeca Film Festival. And then this movie, um, starring Chris Brown, is, um, was released earlier this fall in movie theaters. Um, I'm not sure if anyone noticed it, but it, was, it had a really brief stint in, in the movie theater. But actually, it wasn't really all that bad. I saw uh, an advanced screening of it, and um, it started a lot of our friends from New York City, actually. Um, but it, I felt like it was a step up from a lot of the media portrayals from like, you got served and step up. So this was, it rang more true to our culture. So I just wanted to highlight that. And then, so this next event is called the Notorious IBE. IBE stands for International Breaking Event. Um, so this is a three-day festival held in um, the Netherlands. And basically they hijacked this little town called Herlin. I think, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, but tons of b-boys come. They pack up the hotel rooms and their workshops and musical performances and lots of ciphers. Um, and this is a term you'll hear later on, but ciphers are basically um, when you go to a party, you have a circle, and then someone dances in the middle of the circle. So that's what a cipher is. Um, and so again, you see there are tons of people that are uh, um, attending, and this is a, a Photoshop picture of a b-boy called Blonde representing um, Korea. And so this is another major European event that happens. And then you have Red Bull BC1. Uh, which is, of course, sponsored by Red Bull. And this started in 2004. And Red Bull BC1 is probably one of the most prestigious one-on-one -on -one battles in the world happening right now. And they have multiple qualifying events all around the world. So I chose these two pictures here because you see um, we have La Paz, which is um, in Bolivia, and then Oman, which is in south, right south of Saudi Arabia. So it's really... Um, it's a really international event, and it's, it's huge. I mean, this is just a qualifier, I think. I don't, I don't know where, but you can see there's a lot of people there. <laughs> and then finally, we have an event called R16 that happens in Korea, 
And the first R16, I believe, started in 2009, um, 2009, 2010. And um, I wanted to highlight this because um, not only is this a major international event, but this is the first event to use a set judging system that was developed by a b-boy named Dizzy from Toronto. And I will get into the details of this specific judging system later. But I wanted to point out, so this is um, from this year's uh, R16, and you have a Korean crew on this side right here. <laughs> called Morning of Owl, and they were in the finals versus Body Carnival from Japan. And these two people right here are, are B-girls, and they are really good. And it's really, I just wanted to highlight them because they're Kati and I, like one of our favorites, and in a male-dominated, yeah, it's really rare because, you know, breaking is such a male-dominated um, art form or sport, however you want to look at it, um, that, you know, to get to the finals in such an international battle is really difficult. Um, okay, so. So that was kind of an overview of the, some of the biggest events that happen internationally. But as Susie said earlier, the events that happen here, especially here in New York, which is where Breaking started, look and feel very different. Um, and part of that is because of the decline of the popularity of Breaking in the 80s, and then Breaking being pushed into this um, image of hip hop as being something that's negative and something that's kind of like, kids becoming gangsters and we just don't we don't have the support behind us that we have that other countries have in those big events so these are images here of a cipher so what we were looking at before were just giant competitions big tournament style high prize money tons of people flying in from over the world high profile judges what happens in new york are smaller events or what happens in the u.s in general but new york are smaller events um that often have local judges, often we or our friends are judging, um, people come all the way from Connecticut, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not the same kind of thing. There's prize money is in the hundreds of dollars at best as opposed to the thousands. Um, and they're kind of expected to be a little unorganized, a little raw, not as polished. And uh, what happens at these, events, hopefully if there's enough room, is that you have this main competition where there's people judging, and then you have these side circles called ciphers. And I'm sure you guys have experienced these at clubs after a couple drinks, or at your friend's bar mitzvah or whatever, where people stand in a circle and then someone goes in the middle and like does, you know, Beyonce single ladies and everyone claps for them. That actually is something that's like meaningful for us. Um, so a cipher is that organic battle. And oftentimes in a cipher, people do compete. It's not just one person going in the middle and being silly and going out. A cipher uh, can enable call out battles. So if you want to battle someone and you guys were not selected to battle each other in the main competition just because of the random draw, you can battle that person in a cipher. You can call them out. And what, you know, that whole you got served, that's not a joke. Like people actually do that. You can co up to someone and make it known that you want to battle them, and then the people standing around you in that circle will watch, enable it, and no one wins, but that is where battling came from, and that is kind of disappearing in today's competitions, especially with the influence of international competitions being on the big stage and having spectators seated and having big cameras and prize money. There's not really room for this organic battle. So there's a lot of people especially in New York where these ciphers started saying, we want to get back to how it was, you know, in the 80s, early 80s, uh, where things were real, where things were raw. And, you know, that's, that's a good question. It's a good discussion. Do we really want to go backwards or, or are things better now for b-boys? Are we kind of getting more recognition on an international level that we wouldn't have gotten if we stayed in these small little ciphers? So. That's the difference, competition cipher. So for the competition, so Susie and I have both thrown events. We are organizers of events. And what gets people here in the, in the US, so forget these big international events, but here what gets people to come to your event is if there's high prize money, which could mean a couple hundred dollars, you know, it's not like you're gonna make a living on this, but uh, something that at least maybe pays your gas money, pays your admission to the event, low admission to get in, that your venue has a wood floor or at least not a carpet or, or something that's not dirty. Um, these are, I mean, we don't like, 
we don't get a lot of resources here, especially in New York where it's super crowded. So you're often, I've battled in hallways at events, Hall, like we're gonna do tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, good music, so having a good DJ, someone who, the best DJs were also b-boys, so our DJ tonight actually used to break. And it's just knowing what the dancers like, what they feel, knowing how to DJ for a battle is very different than just pressing play on, on a song and letting it go. You don't want people battling to the same, if a song is seven minutes long and people are going back and forth on one song the whole time, a lot of it is about musicality and about the dancers responding to the music and you want a DJ who plays awesome music that we're not sick of and music that will be active enough, vibrant enough and change enough time so that the battle stays exciting. Um, and then exhibition battles, there's a lot of like, oh, this guy from California looks a lot like this guy from Minnesota, and we think that they should battle each other, so we're going to spend our little funds to fly them out to our battle, not even call a winner, it's just an exhibition, and that attracts more people. And then having good judges. And we're going to talk a lot about judging, and how judging is such a controversial topic in, in breaking, um, but you know, everyone has a different opinion of what's a good judge. So. Yeah, so that's what attracts people to an event. So judging, very, the, the traditional judging is really just, you are the judge who's done this before, you are a dancer, and you pick the person who you think won. <laughs> that's the rule. <laughs> so, um, and here we see at Red Bull BC1, the judges are the, uh, the five people on the stage there, and they're holding up cards that say El Nino or Rocks Right, which are two b-boys who are super famous in the US. And um, that they're really just holding up those cards at the moment. They're not explaining themselves. They're not say, you know, giving a score. This is traditional judging. You can throw a tie, and then maybe there's a tiebreaker. But you can see how judging is very, very personal, very subjective. And oftentimes, at these battles, Judges will pass a mic around before the battle starts saying like what they're gonna look for when they judge. And they say, what I'm gonna look for is musicality. If you don't hit the beat, I'm not gonna give you any credit. It's not points, it's just like props. You know, there's no, there's no system in, traditionally. Or they say, I'm gonna look for you doing clean moves. If you crash at all, that's not, that's not okay. Or I'm gonna look for you being original. If you crash, but you were doing something more original than the other guy, okay. I'm gonna look for you to respond to someone. This is a conversation like we're talking about here. It's not just you dancing by yourself. You need to be responding to other people. So every judge has a different way that they think a battle should go. And there's oftentimes calls that, that the crowd doesn't ag agree with or that the, the battlers don't agree with. And then the judges get called out in the cipher. So, <laughs> and that's kind of part of it. That's part of what makes this scene so interesting. Um, and that is totally eliminated in these bigger events that actually have judging systems and don't have ciphers. So you can kind of start to see the difference between what happened in New York in the beginning and what still is kind of happening here now versus what's happening on stage in Korea, for example. Okay. Okay, so to address some of these issues that Katya just spoke about, um, I mentioned earlier that Dizzy, this b-boy from Toronto, from uh, Supernatural's crew, he tried to put together a judging system. And the concept first came up in, um, I think, 2000. And then throughout the years, it's been tweaked. And then finally, in 2010, it was implemented at R16. Um, of course, it's been play tested and all that. But so R16 was the first major scale jam that this judging system was used. And it's called the OUR system, and it stands for, okay, it's not up here. So it stands for like objective, unified, and real time. And the five different categories that um, judges will look for using this system is foundation, originality, dynamics, execution, and battle. And so this is just basically a screenshot of one of the, the battles that happened at R16, and you see like the scores that were given for this side, and I'll, describe to you in the next slide um, a little bit more about um, the judging system. So foundation, so what does that mean? So foundation includes, um, this was taken from their website, <laughs> so um, which is rbboys.com. So foundation includes confidence. And actually they state that confidence can come into play in any of these categories. And uh, musicality is also really key because after all this is a dance. 
So um, you have five judges, and each judge is responsible for giving a score from one to five for, e for their designated category, okay? So the next category is originality. So this is one of the things that is difficult for traditional judges because everyone kind of has their own idea um, of originality and creativity. But um, under Dizzy's system, he, categorize, he characterizes this as um, having some sort of personality or character when you dance. Um, it can also include if you utilize a certain concept. So for example, when you do a throwdown and your concept is circles. So a specific dancer might choose to do, you know, he'll spin up top and then come down and spin in the bottom and every, that concept will be circles and, you know, he'll utilize that idea in his round. So that, that, that counts as originality. Um, the third one is dynamics. And I feel like this is kind of self-explanatory, but speed, strength, balance, flexibility, and risk of injury. So it's like the difficulty of the moves. And I mean, they say risk of injury, but you know, for different people, what's difficult for me may not be difficult for the next person. So, um, and then execution. So you don't want to see anyone stumbling or dragging their foot in a move that shouldn't be dragged. Um, and your level of commitment when throwing your body to do something, um, and, all, and cleanliness. And then the last one is the battle aspect. So battling, when you're battling someone, you want to respond and try to one-up their move. And this, is, this goes all the way back to how breaking you know, became more and more developed, where people are trying to you know, do something better than the next. And um, so this is kind of interesting because you know, it brings up the question, so if I go out first, you know, how, how will you score me on that? Because I'm not following anyone up. I'm not really one-upping anyone. Um, and so the solution for that is that you just get a number, th you get three points, which is like the average score. And then it's up to the next person. So you can utilize that as a, a form of strategy um, as well. So, you know, there are different ways that, you know, once you know the system, you can try to like play around with it. Um, so that's basically, those are the five aspects of the judging system. And I already mentioned that you have one judge per category, you give points from one to five. Um, and so each judge has uh, an iPad, and after each round, they'll input their score, and then it'll show on the screen after each round so the teams will know where they stand. And then at the end of the battle, um, the side with more categories won, win the whole battle. And then if there's, in the case of a tie, then you add up the, the individual points, and then the side with more points wins. So that is pretty much the only judging system that's in play right now. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's it, that's all we have. Um, so with R16, you also ut utilizing this judging system, um, in the preliminaries, you get a, sco like a score, and then they pick the top, I don't know, what is this, like eight? <laughs> And then this is how they seed them. And so this is basically a transition into introducing um, our traditional competition form, which is single elimination. And um, I mean, I'm sure you guys all know how single elimination works, but I, pulled, I put up this slide here from Rebel BC1. I don't know if you can see the individual names because they're kind of blacked out, but um, they have also their, f okay, I guess it's kind of difficult to see, but um, in 2010, the finals was held in Tokyo for Rebel BC1, and Negin representing Brazil was the one that won. And um, some of these other names are kind of cool, because as dancers, we all have dance names. You know, this is B-Girl Gypsy, and I'm Queen Envy, and so you have someone, you know, a B-boy named Kill, and, uh, <laughs> and Beast, and you have Thesis, um, and they all have individual meanings for them, and you know they have their flags next to their name that represent countries from all around the world. Um, so that's the most common battle format, and you can tweak this for a two-on-two, two, for a five-on-five, five, for a ten-on-ten, ten, um, for B-girl battles, um, which is a whole debate in itself whether there should be B-girl battles or not. Um, because females shouldn't be separated, and you want independence, right? You want to. <laughs> so, um, 
okay, so single elimination battles. And then um, because a lot of dancers have become a little bored of your traditional single elimination, throughout the years, um, we've tried to come up with variations and different types of battles in different concepts. So this um, is called Summon a Smoke. And within the past 10 years, it's become very popular. Um, I couldn't find a video on explaining it, so I'll just try to explain it to the best of my ability. Um, this is just basically a flyer for a, a Floridian battle. Um, but the way it works is you have eight b-boys, and they all stand in a line. The first two b-boys battle each other. The loser goes to the end of the line, and the winner gets a point. The winner stays there and battles the next person in line. And then again, the judges make their call immediately, and the loser goes to the back of the line, and the winner stays out and gets a point. So if it's that same person, he would have already racked up two points. And so this goes on until someone gets seven points, and that's the winner. Any questions on that? <laughs> Does that make sense? It's endurance also. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Endurance, um, strategy, a lot of strategy. Um, a, a good friend of mine, my crewmate actually, um, He's a self-proclaimed expert on winning seven to smokes. <laughs> and yes, yep. We'll do a we'll do a four to smoke, yeah, um, because it takes it takes a while. Um, but basically, his strategy is, you know, I never win more than three at a time because you know that way I save my stamina. And then so the person who looks like they're winning in the beginning, they get like five wins they kind of run out of stuff and you know they're really tired so ne they never really get to finish those other two points so that's his strategy and everyone has their own you know take on how they want to play this um, so that's the seven to smoke format which you will see later and then so this came up earlier this year actually in uh, an event in Austria and the it's called checkmate and I'm just gonna play the video and it will explain to you how it works Oh my god, what happened? Welcome to Checkmate, a 5 vs 5 crew battle. Each crew has 3 pawns, 1 king and 1 queen. A pawn starts the first round and one of the enemy's crew's pawns has to answer. After these two runs, the judges decide who was better. The loser has to leave the dance floor. The one crew still has five players, the other one is left with four. The king has the power to challenge a specific dancer from the opposing crew before he starts the battle. But if the king challenges a dancer, it's a pure one-on-one -on -one situation. No routines, no commandos. After the two runs, the judges decide who stays and who has to leave the dance floor. The queen also has special abilities. She is able to revive dancers and get them back to the dance floor. Every time the queen wins a run, a lost dancer gets back to the game. However, the queen can't kick dancers off the dance floor. So if you lose against her, you don't have to leave and stay in the game. If the queen loses, she has to leave the dance floor and the crew can't revive any more players. There's always a chance for routine, but if the king is part of the routine, he's not allowed to choose his opponent. The crew who manages to kick out every player from the opposing crew wins the battle. So that's the checkmate format. Um, and let's see if it happens again and if people start taking more interest in it and then um, maybe it'll become more widespread um, around the world. Yeah, that's the gamers format. Um, so, <laughs> so this, real quick, this is a gem that I threw with Eddie Yu um, called Unlucky Breaks. We threw it about a year ago here in New York and we both work in games. 
and we thought it would be fun to throw a battle that was a little more lighthearted and a little unorthodox and involved more game mechanics. So it's called Unlucky Breaks because it's kind of about gambling. You spin a wheel and on that wheel is a handicap and you don't know what you're gonna get. And the handicap will make you, it will give for you and the person you're battling, so it was a one-on-one, -on -one, something that you're really not used to doing when you dance. For example, wearing a tutu. <laughs> or dancing to Britney Spears. Or, um, I don't know, there was a ton of these handicaps. So uh, this, this got a lot of interesting reviews from the breakdance community. Um, a lot of people loved it. A lot of people said, this is really awesome because it allows me to freestyle. So there's this big debate. It's not even a debate. It, there's just a lot of talk about if you make sets, if you make up moves before you go out and in your head you know what you're going to do when you go battle, that's not real or that is scripted. You know, it's like saying I'm a freestyle MC, but I wrote the whole thing beforehand. And if you have to do the same thing, but this time you're wearing boxing gloves, then you might not be able to do everything you wanted to do, and you're gonna have to improvise. You are forced to improvise, which is how the dance started. So a lot of people liked it because it kind of, in a weird, roundabout way brought it back to what it originally was. Um, we also caught a lot of flack for it. People saying, this is goofy, this is not serious, this is putting a bad image on breaking, we should be taking seriously, this is a step backwards. So, I mean, just to put it out there, hopefully we'll throw this event again and you guys should all come. Um, and, yeah. Oh, uh, sure, okay, so um, one thing that also was kind of controversial in this was that there's there's another um, there's a couple other events that have been thrown in the past one was called a props battle so there's props on the dance floor like a chair or a bed or whatever and you have to dance using those props that was been thrown years ago a couple times and then also a battle called the octagon where you take those yellow traffic cones you put them in an octagon and you must not knock them over there's a line connecting them so you can jump in and out of them but you can't like go all the way to the side and it's over there. You have to use the space. So we, um, we used props and costumes. We also made a bizarragon where we just made it into whatever crazy shape we wanted, even if it was like this skinny and you had to dance with it. And our dancers ended up knocking it over and playing telephone. And it was just really fun, whereas the octagon is a very serious battle. So we got a little bit of uh, flack for that as well. Um, so there was a game called B-Boy. I don't know if anyone ever played it. It was for the PS2. Uh, it actually, it got some decent reviews, decent on Metacritic, but some pretty horrible reviews from people who played it. Uh, it was kind of, <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of polarizing. It's like some people really hated it. And then there were people who were saying things like, oh, you know, this was cool because I got to learn about breaking moves, so and it was an educational experience. And then the comment that I thought was the most telling was people said that this game is a lot more fun to watch than to play. And I don't think they were meaning sitting down and being next to someone who's playing. I think they were meaning you decide on a combo and then you watch what your character does. Because the characters in the game were motion capture of famous b-boys. So you're, you know, I mean, maybe just watch them on YouTube instead of playing this <laughs> mediocre game. But there was an attempt on making this into a video game. Um, and then, okay, so finally, what we're really trying to talk to you about is just how, not necessarily how breaking and competitions are game-like or what's the game inside of them, but what, what the direction of b-boying is going into and how culturally that's shifting. Um, so, one, one thing where b-boys complain a lot, okay, you know, why does a snowboarder, pro snowboarder, make $400,000 in four months by going to a bunch of competitions and winning first place? Whereas a b-boy who wins first place at a bunch of competitions will maybe make a couple thousand dollars, maybe two thousand. You cannot live off of it. So why not? Why don't we have sponsors? Why don't we have big lights and big money? Why are there only four giant competitions that we can think of off the top of our heads? Why aren't there hundreds? And our theory is that it's because of it's because of a lot of things. It's because of a negative image of hip hop, but it's also because of lack of equipment. That's one of the beauty. That's one of the beautiful things about b-boying is that you can just do it wherever. You don't need anything. To snowboard, you need a snowboard. 
you know? To play basketball, you need a basketball. For breaking, you just need you. You don't even necessarily need shoes. I've seen people break barefoot, it's disgusting, but you can do it. You don't need special clothes. So there's no equipment to sponsor, and that makes a big difference in our scene. It takes a lot of the money out of it. Um, the formation of leagues, so there are, I mean, there are, a, it's hard because there's this talk about what is a league and a team and basketball league and the NBA or whatever versus what is a crew. And a crew is family and a crew is the people you grew up with and the people that you train with. And now there's a lot of super crews which are take the best person from this crew and that crew and that crew and put them together like NBA all-stars all or whatever. And that is also, I mean, there's a lot of things that are polemic and contentious and breaking and that's one of them that you're taking this, we are a gang, we are a family and breaking it up into these are a collection of talented people. And if those collection of talented people get sponsored and the rest of the crew is left behind, then that's kind of going against the traditional culture. Um, and then there's a bunch of concerns over where, the, where this art and sport is going. So um, I'm going to start at the bottom, actually, with art versus sport. It's hard. You know, we've said those, both of those words a lot in this presentation. And it's hard, because a dance is an art, but a competition is really a sport. And breaking is so athletic that it kind of crosses both boundaries. And therefore, it's very hard to categorize, um, which makes it very hard to present to people. Uh, it is also, there's an overemphasis on competition right now. So these big competitions in Korea or in Germany, where people sit down like you guys are and watch people on a big stage. is very different than how it began. And it also means that, um, sorry, I totally just lost my train of thought. I'll skip that one. Go to overexposure. <laughs> taking, well, so we see breaking now on commercials. So like Samsung commercials, you see B-Boys. Or I just took a flight on Virgin, and they have a new little Virgin like safety demonstration with the dance. It's crazy. And there's like one second of these two B-Boys in it that you can barely see what they're doing, but you know that they're break dancing. And, um, so you're not really learning anything about it, but it's in the pop culture, it's in commercials. And what is that really doing for us? Like, what are these step-up movies doing for us? What is people saying pop and lock in like the way, way back with Steve Carell, if you guys just saw that? I mean, what is it doing for our culture? Not much, because it's not really explaining what it really is that we do, but it is exposing us. So we are getting gigs, and we are getting, you know, to work at people's parties and to do performances. So there's, there's a positive and a negative that goes with it. Um, actually, you know, do you want to talk about the exploitation point? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so another concern of ours is exploitation. And so with the push to try to form these, these leagues and unions of b-boys and also maybe to try to get some corporate sponsorship, um, I mean, it happens overseas, but let's say, like, you know, we're talking about the U.S. now. Um, it's really difficult for dancers um, to get corporate sponsorships, you know, not only for the, some of the stuff that we just talked about, but we, we don't really know, well not, so as dancers, a lot of people don't know how to represent themselves professionally. Um, all they know is just how to dance. And because there's not a lot of money involved, we can't afford to hire agents to speak for us. You know, we don't really understand, you know, how to market ourselves, how to communicate with people professionally. Um, and so when we do get the chance to trust someone who isn't a dancer to help us do these things, um, we're afraid of being exploited. Um, we're afraid of being represented incorrectly. And that's an ongoing issue um, now. So. Um. Cool. So, I mean, that's pretty much it. I hope that you got a little bit of a sense of what it's like to, what are the considerations that you need to think about when you're throwing a b-boy competition? What is the controversy and the tension between traditional breaking from New York back in the 80s and kind of still what exists today versus this international uh, grander scene that is developing now? And um, you know, this also the tension between game, the game of it, the sport of it, and the art of it as well. So thank you very much.
Yeah. And, uh, Um, well, I've seen long and short seven of smokes. There was this one that I went to in Philly where um, B-Boy Babo from Boston, he just ran through all of them. <laughs> and that ended very quickly. Um, I, as a promoter, I would usually allot um, like a 30 minute slot for a seven of smoke. Um, for the checkmate, um, 20 minutes maybe for a single battle. Uh, and again, it all depends and the checkmate hasn't really been used as widely as Seven of Smoke, but around that time, yeah. And also with the, uh, the hour system, what happens if they're still tied after something about the subject of the No, I do know, I, d I can't remember. <laughs> um, is, is there such thing as a tie? There is. That sounds that sounds right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long is each individual battle, and does that differ between formats? Um. So we usually judge uh a, well as if we're promoting an event or organizing an event, we usually do our timing system by about 30 seconds around, and that's generous. So in other dances, a 30 se if you go out and dance for 30 seconds, that'll feel really short, and breaking 30 seconds is incredibly long because you're basically doing gymnastics on concrete. And so if you, if you say it's a one-on-one -on -one and they each get one round, that could be a minute. There's usually a little bit of like walking around and looking tough, but it's <laughs> more or less. Yeah. Uh, Spectators is something that we didn't talk about, but I meant to mention when I had that brain fart earlier, that's what it was, that being a spectator in this is difficult. A lot of the people who go to like these n little events here in New York are b-boys. I would say it's 90% b-boys and maybe 10% people's girlfriends. And <laughs> so, and you guys will see later, we want to do this in something that feels a little more organic to what we actually do and we'll all go out in the hall where the reception is and you're gonna have to like crowd around each other to see because that is what we have to do <laughs> so spectator making this you know cutting down the time to help out spectators and help out b-boys who are waiting for it is important i wanted to also make a note um, as promoters sometimes uh when seating we pick names out of the hats oftentimes um people will kind of predict who are the better dancers and they'll try to seed them so that we have good battles too. And a lot of people complain about this because it's not, you know, real and it's not fair, but it's something that we still have to consider as promoters. Yes. So in the gaming community, you have to be a good sport when you lose. What's like the etiquette for winning and losing? Uh, you were just laughing. <laughs> 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 one, <laughs> one battle that I went to a while ago, the uh, one guy lost. He didn't feel like he deserved to lose. He called out my friend who was judging, 
And afterwards, he's, it, he looked really angry. We didn't know who he was. He had traveled from far away. And afterwards, he came up to us and he said, thanks for letting me call you out, man. <laughs> You know, I just wanted, I felt like I lost, so I felt like I wanted to prove myself in another way. So he looked super mad, totally lost his cool, called out the judge, made a big scene, just so he could do something and feel like he was contributing to the vibe of the event. <laughs> so if that, I mean, there's a whole spectrum. Yes. So during a, during a battle, during a competition battle, um, it's highly frowned upon that you touch or push the other person. Um, that does happen, and fights will break up, and, um, and we'll try to stop it as soon as possible. Not in recent years, but New York City is known <laughs> in the early 2000s to be a, <laughs> a very aggressive scene. Being aggressive is part of it, right? If you stand up and you're like, oh, okay, my round's done. You know, that's, you want to be like, I just smoked you, and like do that little thing. So sometimes it looks like the fight's gonna break out, and then it doesn't, and then they're friends, and you're, as the spectator, you're a little thrown off by that. Actually, it's interesting you say that because uh, a lot of, uh, it's such an integral part of breaking, is this almost like the player avatar kind of like disconnect, like uh, uh, we're supposed, to, we can be completely different outside of the dance floor uh, than we are in the dance floor. And you're supposed to have this uh, aggressive, very like testosterone-filled persona, and you're supposed to uh, express supremacy and then just, you know, like act like you won even if you didn't. Now what happens is a lot of people can't, um, uh, can't make that distinction, and it'll get personal, it'll get physical, and then they'll just start throwing punches, and obviously like as promoter, that ruins everything for us, but uh, it happens. Right here, you've been waiting for a while. Oh, um, are there, uh, I don't know how to put it, IP issues with people's moves? Yes. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, so there's a word called a bite. This is a bite sign. This means that you bit somebody's move and took it for your own. So, and then, I mean, there's also, I think there's a YouTube video that floated around like years and years ago called Everything is a Bite and it showed how like every breaking move has come from traditional African dance, from capoeira, from martial arts. So like stop throwing the bite sign because it's all been done before, no one's unique. Um, but I think it's more than just a single move but stringing together moves in interesting ways, that is very personal and can be very um, characteristic. So we talk sometimes about, I don't know if we say this in New York, but in Colorado where I used to live, we talk about silhouette dancing. So if you can see someone in a silhouette and know who they are by their movement, and then someone else copies that exactly, that is, that's a real bite, you know? And then you see the bite sign thrown in battles a lot. So yes, there are IP issues. And there's also a saying that we say, it's, um, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So it's, it depends on the context of what you're using your moves in as well. Okay. Well, so <laughs> judging technically should be the same. So Katya and I enter battles all the time where we're going up against other guys. And we've also done a lot of B-girl battles as well. And I mean, you're really, we have something called easy props for girls, where if we do something and they'll be like, oh my God, good for you, you did such a great job. And if a B-boy does the exact same thing, they're like, meh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, ideally it should be the same, but we do have this problem where we get easier points oftentimes. Yeah, there's, I mean, the ratio, the ratio of guys to girls in the scene, I would say even internationally, I would go that far, is probably one girl to 50, at least. It's that rare. It's really that rare. I've been in practice spots or in jams before where I can count, there's maybe 200 people and I can count five girls and some of them are maybe just starting and they're never gonna stick with it. Like it's, you know, so yeah, we wanna say we're judged the same, but we're not. So you've been waiting in the red shirt right here. Yeah, yes you, the orange <laughs> something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I was actually wa wondering, because it's, it's, I don't know, like the competition aspect, but then it's like, it's like my daughter, you know, when you dance, and in her classes, like she's taking modern dance, and hip-hop dance, and mm -hmm. ballet, and everything, it's usually like one dude to like the rest of the class is girls. I was wondering, maybe, what about, you know, just the breaking scene? Uh, I mean, I know hip-hop in general has been like the majority, like male-dominated since. 
So um, physically, there's definitely a difference. It's, I've taught tons and tons of girls. I've taught classes that are for girls only. And then I've taught boys as well. And guys just can pick up this movement easier. I hate to say it, you know, but I've been in this a decade and it's true. Um, and it's also, I think part of it is, is being a little nervous. There's something about like kids where boys are just willing to throw their heads on concrete and girls are not. <laughs> and uh, part of it all is that some of the foundational movements of breaking are very difficult movements, even though those are the basics. So if you say, okay, you're gonna take salsa dance and the foundational movement is to do these three steps and then these three steps. If you're not a dancer, you could probably do that on your first try, even if you do it poorly. If I say, okay, this is a windmill, and I spin around on the floor, and I say, that's a very foundational movement of breaking, try it. You know? If that's, it's just, it's, uh, it's hard physically. Eddie, you wanted to say something about the topic? Yes, Uh, okay. so, so have there been efforts to kind of transform what is considered breaking so that it becomes more accessible to kind of a wider range of, of people, you know, be they male or female? Or is it, is it conservative in that sense that you know, this is considered breaking and that isn't? Is that holding back kind of that increasing diversity? So I, I think that I think that it is. It's very conservative in what's considered breaking and what's not. Breaking has elements. It has your top rock where you're standing up, your footwork where you're on the floor, your freezes where you're holding a pose, your power moves where you're moving, and then it has like whatever else you want to add into it. But there is a line. You can't just come out and be like, I know capoeira, and just do capoeira. You're not breaking if you do that. And so people are very, it didn't used to be like that. I think in the 90s, you could, you could come into a breaking battle and like lock or pop and people would be like, oh, look, you're, you have multi-talents. But now it's not like that at all. It's, it's really rigid. You see moves that are interesting and new, but they're still in that kind of aesthetic of what breaking is. And I think that people would be angry if we tried to kind of water it down and be like, oh, these are easier movements that more people can pick up, that girls can pick up easier, that non-dancers can pick up easier. I think the this, this scene would be like, what is that? That's not breaking. We don't want to see it in our battles. All right, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Let's get started.